Okay. The next general fund budget that I wanted to cover is civil service, and this is one that um, looks very outsized when you start when you think about what the civil service commission actually does. The civil service commission uh, for departments that are covered and positions that are covered under that um, does our and manages our hiring process for positions. So this would include police, fire, uh, a lot of there are some positions in, in city hall that would be covered as well. Uh, departments that have an independent board and commission that uh, oversee their operations are not covered under civil service. So parks is not civil service. Uh, public service services is not uh, civil service, library is not civil service. Um, but unless it's a specifically exempt position, like say city manager, they fall underneath the civil service umbrella. That's actually a fairly minimal piece of this. The other piece that gets funneled through here is actually the cost of uh, retiree health insurance benefits for people that go out under disability retirement underneath our 411 retirement system. Those have to be accounted for somewhere. And anybody that uh, is uh, retired under the disability provisions of either police or fire, the city has a continuing obligation to statutory continuing obligation to fund their health care expenses so it's they are individualized health care premiums based on the conditions so it's not the same as for example buying a single or a family health insurance policy uh, the premiums get adjusted based towards the risk for that particular individual so it does vary uh, from year to year based on risk and the number of people that are covered but it's not one that we can sidestep or just say we want to stop doing that. And in this one, we are um, uh, looking at engaging the services of consultant to assist with the promotion process in the fire department for the creation of the battalion chief positions. Uh, okay. Elections. Um, Elections typically goes up every other year. We do have an amount budgeted in here for a potential special election should the council choose to uh, look at a different date than the regular election for the CIP levy. But we also then have an obligation to pay a percentage of costs for the regular general election that will get held. So with City Hall, um, this is the one where we have the execute time module budgeted. Um, this is kind of a catch-all category for a lot of those central operations. So when we have something like that, this is where those numbers get accounted for. But it does also include the operations of this building. Um, City Hall, I know everybody still thinks of it as the new City Hall, but it's 13 years old. Uh, the scary thing for me is to think that the police station, I think, now is five years old. Uh, so they've been around longer than people think, and we are starting to see some uh, maintenance costs with this one. Just things that need to be done for general upkeep, carpet cleaning, maintenance, etc., to make sure that we're getting good service life out of the facility. And I, I covered the execute module for everybody a little bit before, unless you had questions about that. I think that that's going to be something that will be a big um, continual labor savings for us as we automate a lot of those functions moving forward. Okay. So local option sales tax. We receipt these into this fund and then we do a transfer out to the uh, capital projects fund for planned projects. So that will vary some from year to year based on actual needs. We do have some money in local option sales tax from the original 2009 to 2014 tax that we're still hanging on to. Um, the Trunk sewer project has not moved forward as fast as initially expected, um, but also the early phases have not cost anywhere near what we initially thought they were going to. So if you were to look at what we thought the first three phases were going to cost, we would have expected that to exhaust the um, budget that we put into the original loss, and some of them came in at about 50% of what the initial construction costs were estimated to be. So it's done well, but and we just have to make sure that we're administratively tracking that balance as future phases for the trunk sewer continue to get completed, we will continue to spend that balance down. You have a question, Mayor? Well, so there's, there's money that we had expected to use, but we didn't use it? It hasn't been used yet. Yeah, but it will be used. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yep. I was... 
I was hoping there's some extra there we could do use to build the bridge over uh, for for uh, <laughs> no, for, for uh, Albanet Road. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that we learned from the first to the second local option sales tax is on the first one, we were too specific on the ballot language. Yeah. So we dedicated, for example, 26% to the trunk sewer project, 31% to roads, okay. and so on down the line. The second time around, we were a lot less specific to allow for a lot more flexibility in the uh, use of those funds. So okay. um, because that use is governed by the ballot language, it has to go for those purposes. All right. So it's with not just, not just infrastructure, it's very specific. Very specific. Okay. With our attorneys hired, that money will start to be expended for the trunk sewer as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that progress is moving now. Okay. So the sewer replacement fund uh, is actually right now a fairly unique fund amongst the list of ones that we have. Um, when you look at, a, at, an, at a, a replacement fund, like the equipment replacement fund or a road use replacement fund, those are for equipment, you know, either pieces of equipment that are being used or rolling stock. The sewer replacement fund <coughs> dates back to and maybe even to and maybe even before the um, trunk sewer project came online. When the trunk sewer project was being conceived and the budgets were being put together for that, uh, it was some fairly astronomical figures for Marion. And so they put together a funding plan for that and, and started to put money into this fund for maintenance and replacement of sanitary sewer infrastructure. Um, the original plan would have called for a series of bond issuances and a planned series of rate increases for anywhere between um, 5 and 9% a year for a period of uh, over, it was at least 10 years, if not beyond that, to help pay for the cost of the trunk sewer project. So when the local option sales tax was passed, initially, it assumed a bunch of those costs and really let us moderate a lot of those sewer increases. But in the current budget, we are uh, looking to start using this fund for other pieces as well. Um, it it's allowable, it can go towards anything in the uh, overall sewer system, but it's not like the other ones where this one was intended to be set aside to replace, say, the sewer jetter or something like that. So I just wanted to make sure you really understood that distinction. Um, this one really was the, f the fund on the sanitary sewer side that was set up for capital projects. When we talk to you about looking at separating out the fees between, so you understand how much of a rate increase is going to capital projects and how much of it is funding operating costs this is the kind of uh, kind of framework that we'd be looking at. So we have a couple of annual programs. One would be um, re, uh, the primary one would be sanitary sewer repairs and um, making sure that we continue to do our slip lining and manhole. Uh, renovation projects because that has a significant impact on inflow and infiltration into the sewer system. And as we move over to a flow-based agreement with Cedar Rapids, every piece of groundwater or clean water, storm water that we can keep out of the system, every gallon that doesn't go down that pipe is a gallon that we don't pay for treating. So uh, it's going to have uh, double benefits for us in making sure that the system life is extended, but also reducing our costs that we pay for treatment. There's no reason to treat water that's already clean or to pay for treating water that's already clean. Lon, do we know how long, uh, what's the projected forecast for uh, all of the slip lining that we need to do? Is that run out another 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? Do we know how many more millions of miles of that stuff we need to do? We have not done a study for that. We are currently have HDR doing the full-blown study to figure out w when Prospect Meadows came in to figure out what size that needs to be. So some of that's kind of a, a mute point because it might be not large enough the way it is. So, for example, one of the estimates that previous councils used was at the time we were growing much slower, and so they assumed in 2020 we'd be a population of 33,000. We've already surpassed that. <laughs> so it, it doesn't make sense, just like right now, it doesn't make sense for us to run a 72-inch pipe all the way to the city of Albernet because there's no point in us taking that over, and by the time we would expand that far, more than likely that size wouldn't be big enough because of the expansion. So you're going to have to look at future forecasts and decide what you're going to do with that. Um, so, you know, our new sewer mains that are put in are 20-foot sticks. 
um, versus the old clay lines were two and three foot. So we don't have a, a master program that says how much more we have to do, but um, I can tell you that, that money pays for itself. Right, and that's why I was kind of wondering at, other than the labor, do we see a substantial increase by inflation for product alone? I mean, is that something that we would want to try to get on the front side and try to maybe do an extra year's worth in one particular run if the bid came in? You know, it just because I know it's an ongoing project, I just didn't know if that material goes up substantially each and every year from an inflation standpoint? No, what we do do is when we do get the bids in, if, say, we, the budget's $200,000 for slip lining and the bid comes in at 150, we always do a change order to expend as much money as possible. So the past two years, we've actually brought change orders back to city council to add more lines so that we're utilizing as many of those dollars as we can. So we're capitalizing on the linear foot uh, for the budget that it was allowed for. Yep. That's great. Okay, and this great. is an area where um, public services and engineering have to collaborate because uh, Ryan's crews know where the trouble spots are. And if you look at a lot of the areas where we've been concentrating on doing the slip lining, they're in the older neighborhoods and they're in ones where you know how many properties are going to get connected to it. It's not areas where you've got, you know, a trunk sewer line heading up north that is going to have another 40 or 50 properties potentially added to it. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Stormwater management is another one that, um, this is one of our newer utilities. It's been on the books for a long time, but we made that switch, oh, I think maybe 2010, 2011, to going over to an equivalent uh, residential unit or an equivalent runoff unit. There are two separate ways to say the same thing, um, where you charge larger properties a multiple of what a typical residential property in Marion contributes to the system for stormwater. So, you know, a business with 10,000 square feet of impervious surface may pay four ERUs, but it was intended to move that to a more of a utility basis again so that you're paying commensurate with the demand that you're putting on the system. So with the capital projects on this side, We've got a major regional stormwater basin that's going to be coming online that we'll need to start constructing up on the northwest side of the city. Um, storm sewer themselves, uh, this does pay for maintenance. Uh, it does pay for uh, Steve Cooper's position in engineering, uh, for working with contractors, doing a lot of our uh, education programs, making sure that we're doing <coughs> construction monitoring to ensure that things that are not supposed to get into the storm sewer system are not getting into the storm sewer system. Uh, one example I can give you is that uh, occasionally, for whatever reason, even though you provide a spot for them to clean out, um, sometimes people that are delivering concrete like to clean out the chute on the truck and they dump it right into the storm sewer. And you can imagine the kind of fits that that solidifying concrete can create for Ryan's crews in having to maintain those basins over time. So uh, we have issued some fines for violations of that in the past, but if we don't have an inspector, those are the types of things that happen um, when you don't have somebody out there looking for and watching for that. Uh, Steve actually has some pictures of someone doing it and literally like four or six feet away in the background, you can see the designated clean-out spot on the construction site. I mean, you think about the number of basements and the amount of roads, private subdivisions that get poured in Marion, uh, it's a pretty daunting task to be handled by one person. Um, this is one of the ones that, in my opinion, is a utility that is not shouldering its own weight. Uh, it's one that does pay some of the uh, pieces that are needed for the oversight and administration, but uh, it's one where we could fully justify having another position that would be dedicated totally to public education and inspection um, and still probably have additional demand beyond that. Uh, but that would require council to consider some fee adjustments for this uh, because a lot of <coughs> the Potential fee adjustments are tied to those capital projects. We just have to be prudent in figuring out, you know, what will the public tolerate at any one given point in time for uh, the needs that we have. And this is an area where we do, um, like the other ones, utilities. Uh, if a if we're working, if a subdivider is building an area that's going to connect to the next subdivision, if the standard says it's got to be a 36 inch 
culvert or a 36 inch pipe and we're going to need them to put in a 42 we do pay the difference and just so council is aware cedar rapids has recently increased their eru base fees and they cut down on some of their caps so previously we were kind of going in parallel with them we kept some of our caps there because they had them there so that'll be something we'll be bringing back to you guys as well well and i got a question kind of a, at, a, at a higher level uh, not specifically to this fund but uh, where we have and under these capital outlay sections of all of the funds where we list project cost or capital projects did i understand it correctly or incorrectly that with this new software we we're going to be able to have separate line items for the different capital projects in other words i'm looking for, i always have a difficult time matching them up matching up cip projects and major projects because some of these are a collection or multiple projects and i thought i'd heard from somebody one time that this new software is going to be able to break these out by line item and then allow us to kind of watch them or track them better or easier is that true or false there is a project accounting function in New World. Okay. I do not profess to be anywhere near proficient enough in New World to know how that works. I know they've looked at it and there's some challenges to being able to set that up. I don't know if it would be as simple as showing the transaction level underneath the capital projects budget or uh, what would be the simplest way to do that. Yeah, transactional level would allow you to see every single project called out, but then it would also create hundreds of pages of paper because then you'd see every single transaction for well, I never want that. I just want a summary. Yeah, we can provide probably the summary so just for the capital um, for the second draft. And when you think about what we've been doing for the, um, as we've been going through the major projects in the CIP, we've been showing you what the dashboards look like and what those timelines look like. Um, my intent would be to put those numbers on those so you'd be able to look at the dashboards for the capital projects and see where we're sitting at with the expenditures. Um, rather than having necessarily look in the software for it, you'd be able to look at those individual project dashboards for anyone oh. that you'd be interested in. Okay. So special revenue, special revenue has uh, many different things that fall underneath this umbrella. Um, but as I <coughs> said earlier, these are the ones that are restricted usage <coughs> accounts. So if the police department is participating with a task force and there's a large forfeiture and the Marion Police Department receives a share of that, that gets run through the special revenue accounts. Um, Swamp Fox, where you have donations that people are making specifically to go towards Swamp Fox, would show up here. Um, federal and state and grants, those types of things that have a restricted purpose or restricted use get funneled through here. Employee benefits is the, sing is the, the bulk of the expenses coming in through here. Um, if you hear me fault use the language trust and agency, um, that's just me being a little bit old school on it. I get teased about it a bit that, you know, I should be using the special revenue vernacular, but it's just hard to get rid of that when I called it that for so many years. Um, and that's how when you look at the... Uh, employee benefits levy it would come in here gets receded into here and then there'd be a transfer out to uh, the general fund for the cost of benefits in the, in the general fund then we start moving into the the special funds um, road use is one of the largest ones that we have um, this year the budget uh, looks like it's taking a big increase um, but that's because we're um, projecting out and splitting out the costs of completing the cost of the new public services facility as part of the overall eco industrial park project and the compressed natural gas conversion um, the assistant director position you know, or the deputy director position that I talked about in public service um, would be allocated out much in the same way that Ryan's is. Uh, Ryan, for example, I believe is 50% road use, 50% sewer, 50% um, solid waste. So the, the overall administrative positions, administrative assistant positions, mechanics, uh, anybody that serves multiple divisions in public service is allocated out to the separate services. So part of that 
position would be reflected in here for a full year. We are so also looking at increasing the amount of support that this is providing for capital projects um, beyond what we've been doing in the past. We know that as a completion of these projects that we are going to be drawing against the fund balance for road use, but um, we've been building that up for a while uh, in anticipation of the, the project and because they've been deferring some of the replacements of the fleet to try to put it together so that um, we'd be replacing the fleet as a whole rather than uh, replacing them individually or a piece or two of equipment every year. So that would be reflected as uh, more of a single use. I'll show you a little bit more detail on that when we get into the road use replacement fund, which is the next slide. So road use replacement, we transfer money out of road use every year, much like we do the general fund where we have an equipment replacement fund. We have we move money out of road use into road use replacement. Uh, it's got the the single biggest fleet in the city, and you know from when I started in the business, and a dump truck costs fifty thousand, and it costs about another twenty five thousand to outfit it. They are a lot more expensive than that these days, and so we've got a lot of rolling stock in there. Uh, as I said. Uh, Ryan has been deferring replacement a lot of those in anticipation of making the shift over to compressed natural gas as the primary fuel. I don't know if you've got anything else you wanted to discuss on that, Ryan? The conversion. <coughs> as we would consider moving these uh, as we go forward and go over to that fleet and replace it as a whole, what would we do with our existing uh, stock of uh, equipment? We would sell it outright, and if so, what would we do with that capital? Um, the way we put the budget together, that capital would go back into the replacement fund for road use. Uh, there's two options the city council can consider, or actually three. One is to trade it in when we acquire the new fleet. Number two is to sell them outright or auction them off, which is looking like that might be the better way to go. Or the third option is that the state of Iowa now has a grant in place to uh, partially fund the acquisition of renewable fuel or compressed natural gas fleets. However, the uh, caveat is that you, you got to drill a hole through the engine block. You got to take it out of service, and so we're going to look at all three as we mm -hmm. as we move forward. So. Thank you. So we expect that conversion to happen in budget year. <coughs> that this budget year that we're talking about. Uh, Nineteen or twenty. 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 Year twenty. Yeah. Fiscal year twenty. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Sanitary sewer is set up the same way. Uh, the, the cost of the new public services facility is being allocated, again, 50, 25, 25 to the, the three funds that would support it. And so when you receipt the... Um, receipt the, re the money from the revenue bond, it's reflected in the sanitary sewer account. Uh, so that's why it looks like it's, it's higher than the prior year. We had anticipated originally in the 1819 budget that we might receipt some of those dollars in this fiscal year. So that's why it looks so much higher than 1718. That's one of the ones that when we work through the second draft of the budget, um, we're going to take a close look at where those are being receded. For example, what we don't want to do is recede it into the sanitary sewer fund and then sh and then transfer it. Transfers are difficult to deal with in the way our budgeting module works. Sometimes it looks like it actually is inflating the budget because it'll show as an expense when you receipt the money and then if you transfer it over to capital projects and then ultimately spend the money out of capital projects, the transfer can sometimes be construed as an additional expense. We just don't want it to, to put in an additional steps that make it look like we're spending more than we are. If I look at these numbers, Lon, for the collections for the revenue side, Again, I kind of had the same comment when I got the December financials that both the budget number for 19 and 20 both look high, especially too compared to the trends of the previous three years as well as what our actual amount is year to date. So if I double that amount, which is more than half a year, all I come up with is $4 million. So it seems that, because we're not increasing our fee substantially, so it seems like both of those numbers 
are significantly high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we had constructed the budget for the current fiscal year, um, because we were looking at um, starting that project a little earlier than we've actually started, I believe we programmed in a, a potential rate increase and talked in equalizing that rates between the um, the non-single family and the uh, multi-family residential. Ryan might have some more to offer on that. And so in, in that line item that you're looking at in the collections, last year when we put together the budget, Cedar Rapids initially said your, your wastewater fees for the month are going to be close to $300,000, okay? We went back, we visited. Um, Cedar Rapids can only charge us the residential cost for the wastewater treatment plant. All right. They went back. They recalculated it. They dropped it down to two hundred eight thousand per month. Okay, and so at that time we didn't we didn't see a need to raise fees at that time, and that came. I think that we got that information in end of February. All right. Now Cedar Rapids just last week got us new information. We're going to take that information, revise it, and you'll see that change. So this will change in draft two. That, that's going to change. All right. Yep. Solid waste is the next one that we had to cover. And again, all of three of these enterprise funds or quasi-enterprise funds are being impacted by the uh, construction of the new facility. Um, solid waste and solid waste replacement are a little bit unique because one of the things that Ryan's board has been considering for a while is um, whether or not when they do the, the fleet replacement, if we should make the shift to moving over to automated collection. And when you do that, one of the things that Marion has never done um, is to uh, have to purchase Yardi carts um, that work with the automated collection system. So if we go that direction, those have to be purchased um, in order to make that system work. Now, I know that his board has debated it a lot. Uh, it's something that has a significant impact on operations. Um, where I look at it is in risk management. Um, the solid waste crew um, outside of the public safety arena, solid waste and sanitary sewer are two of the highest risk occupations in the city. Um, shoulder injuries, slip and falls, um, things like incidents like that that impact your uh, workers' compensation rates and employee absences and employee health um, occur a lot in this area. So automating the collection eliminates a lot of that risk. Uh, it's something that's worth evaluating just for the benefit of the employees. The other difference that it makes is that if you were to look, say, 10 or 15 years ago at automated waste collection, <coughs> It was actually uh, either the same rate or a, 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 a slower than doing manual collections. Um, as with anything, technology evolves and advances. And the uh, uh, last time I looked at it, um, automated collection done correctly can be done at almost twice the rate of manual collection. Um, the other challenge, though, that Marion has had is that for a long time, you know, we use the dual hopper trucks, so you're making one trip to pick up recycling and, and garbage. The automated trucks that were out there were set up for dual pass, where you made one pass to do garbage and then came back on another day to do your recycling. And that really drives your costs up because now you're making two trips past that, that uh, property. A couple of vendors now have come out with dual hopper automated trucks. So uh, technology has caught up more to our service model. So that's when these are put together, that's one of the things that they contemplate is being able to make that shift. I don't know if there's anything else that your board has discussed you want to cover, Ryan? And so the way we put this together, um, obviously the Public Service Board will make a recommendation to the council, but uh, the council, if you don't decide to go down that route, we don't have to. But the way we put it in this budget is a full automation program that includes the bins as well as leaf collection. And so that's how we scoped this whole thing out. There's a lot of conversation to have uh, before we make those decisions, and we're going to get going on that, but that's, that's what we put together. Have we ever considered throwing this out to the public like in an, as, as a citizen survey and um, saying, are you willing to do this for an extra added cost? Not those specific questions, but in previous surveys, we've reached out 
and you've gotten information on what they'd rather look at um, of all the services we do offer. Okay. Probably the most requested service is the art um, for solid waste collection. It, it really is. But um, we have a long ways to go, but we did put it in the budget. Uh, okay. So, so we always have the option not doing that, but we did put it in, put it in the budget. It wasn't part of the decision on who pays for the carts? Yeah, that's a discussion point. Um, to go a full, auto, if we were to go automation, just like Cedar Rapids, we're looking at about 1.5 million for the carts. Okay. Do you have any, does anybody know what the uh, premium reduction in workman's comp would be? I bet they do. I, no, I, can, I can attest we have, we've had some workman comp claims there. <coughs> oh, oh, no, I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't mean on the claims, I mean just on the premiums because oh, I don't know. like, <coughs> Like Lon mentions, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that's probably uh, six to seven dollars per hundred. It's extremely expensive, and quite frankly, I can't imagine the recruiting. Um, you know, who wants to throw garbage anymore? It, that, I, I can imagine you have a major labor issue with that each and every day. Um, you know, we do. It's, it, it's hard to find people to do those manual tasks. Um, but really, it's the efficiencies that you gain. We'll get into this more. Yeah. Um, each driver now collects about 500 houses per day. Um, when you go automated, you can collect anywhere from 750 to 1,000 houses per day. So there's some, there's some cost savings there once you get the program going. Uh, that and days like this, when it's horrible out. I'd rather stay inside a truck. It, it's, it's not fun. Uh, that's where those automated units do provide a benefit to the yeah. employees. Very good. Thank you. And the mod factor, won't the mod factor go down? I'll sling garbage. I'm no problem. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked a bit about the urban forest utility. Um, in this one, we are contemplating, as I said, that that arborist tech would draw against the fund balance. Uh, we are showing a transfer out here. The expansion to the maintenance facility out at Lau is to provide a home for the urban forest operations, um, make sure that we've got a facility that can adequately house the bucket truck and to um, provide some room for some seasonal storage and future uh, potential expansion of the fleet. So equipment reserve, this is the one that really hits the general fund side. So this is where things like building inspection vehicles, engineering total station, um, computer equipment, anything like that that comes out of the general fund that's scheduled for replacement comes through here. Uh, I would say that by and large the departments do a really good job of not replacing something in this we actually absolutely need to replace it. You know, for example, when it comes time to replace a computer, IT takes a look at it and says, okay, you know, what's the service life of it? Can we still get an extended warranty on it? Can we get more life out of it by adding RAM to uh, increase its capabilities? Um, that's one of those arenas where a lot of our equipment is driven simply by um, planned obsolescence from the providers. So network switches and things like that, when they stop providing support and stop providing software patches and updates, you're just you have to replace it, otherwise you start experiencing security vulnerabilities. Um, but you'll see transfers coming out of the general fund to help support this side. Um, because again, oh since some God. of the, and this is a fund that's intended to really smooth out the cash flow needs for that equipment replacement from, from year to year. So uh, you may see a year where we transfer out 700000 from the general fund, but we only have $400,000 worth of expenses programmed. But then the next year we're transferring 700000 out of the general fund and there's $1 million worth of expenses programmed. I will say this is an area we're going to take a really close look at, um, both to make sure that um, we've got everything in there programmed for appropriate replacement schedules, but it is an area that we struggle with because um, in some of those arenas, even though you might program an escalator in cost for the replacement of a piece of equipment, um, we can't transfer dollars out that can keep up with that. Uh, for example, you know, fire equipment would be anticipated to come out of here, but year over year, it's not unusual to see the cost of a fire truck go up seven 
5% or 8%, and if we're only able to increase our allocation 2% or 3% every year, we're falling a little bit behind. Um, we did get some pressure taken off of it um, by um, use of the local option sales tax to replace the ladder truck and to replace a pumper truck in the fire department. So that helped us out to the tune of a couple million dollars. So, Lon, the items in here, these are really those those normal recurring replacement capital expenditures that are not in the CAP. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this would be a lot of your rolling stock, a lot of your specialized equipment. And like in engineering, they have, I think, two total stations that they use for doing survey work out in the field. They replace them in a rotation, so you always have one new one and another one um, in case they either um, stop supporting it software-wise or you experience a failure. But rather than trying to accommodate that every four years in the budget or whatever the replacement schedule is, we simply transfer an amount over here so that we know we've got money set aside to be able to replacement. It literally is a sinking fund for equipment coming out of the general fund. And, and just to chime in, there are going to be a few items each year reflected um, in the capital budget, in the CIP, I should say, that are in uh, equipment reserve as long as they do have a 10-year or greater lifespan and cost $20,000 or more. So there are some equipment that fall in that category. Yeah. Okay. So with this one, um, a couple of the big expenditures coming in uh, would include like replacement of the video cameras in the cars, um, looking at servers and network equipment, those types of things would come out of here. Um, this is also places where you would see stuff that might have a limited service life. You know, like for example, in, in both the fire and police, you know, bunker gear has a limited service life. It can only be certified to be used for a certain number of years. Um, bulletproof vests can only be used for a certain number of years before they're no longer considered to be um, to be used. I don't know what the technical term for it is, Jason. You know, five years. So debt service, uh, debt service, as the name implies, is where we pay for the long-term debt that the city has incurred. Um, this is always tied to the actual amount that we need in the fiscal year for the payments that we're expecting. Uh, right now, the budgeted amount includes a, a one payment for the debt that we're anticipating taking out in FY19. Um, unlike your home mortgage or your car loan where most people pay that on a monthly basis. Uh, city bonds are usually paid twice a year and with when we issue new debt a lot of times we will budget for one payment the following fiscal year because if we were seated in June or uh, in May or June we want to make sure that we have at least one payment in the following fiscal year but it's usually um, gives us a bridge to allow for the full impact of that to hit two fiscal years later to take advantage of some of the growth in the community. So then we get into capital projects. The capital projects budget, as the council knows, uh, is very healthy as far as our ambitions for projects that we want to get to over the next five years. Uh, the budget as it is right now includes about 24 million worth of capital projects um, that would be anticipated to be completed. It does tie back to the CIP. Um, and as we've talked about during the course of the day, the, to complete all those projects, there is going to be additional council action that will be needed. Um, why would we put it all in there? We put it all in there so that you know we don't want to have to necessarily come back and amend the budget later um, if we elected to leave a project out. Um, this is an area then that you know, get to the end of the year. Um, if we can't spend all the dollars, we can't spend all the dollars. But uh, I'd rather do that than have to come back and amend, you know, something like the Eco uh, Industrial Park Public Services Facility in at 13 million um, and have it already in there, rather than have to come back and go through that and do it twice. But as we continue to get um, better about uh, making sure that we've got the staff resources and we've got uh, the financial resources to complete everything that's in the CIP and as we get more clarity from council on what's going to happen with things like the CIP levy, um, then we'll be able to make sure that we're scaling that CIP to the dollars that are going to be available. So that brings us down to uh, the 
areas for the council that um, we really need to uh, get some guidance from you on on decision points for shaping up the second draft of the budget. So uh, as we've talked about, there's a deficit that's shown in the general fund, um, and we have a couple of different ways that we can close that gap. Um, we would fully expect that um, as we move through the, between the first draft and the second draft that we're going to be able to close that gap just by looking at non-personnel expenditures and figuring out what we should put in there, what we should not include in there. Um, there are ways that we can use other financial resources to be able to do, to, um, to reduce that deficit. Um, we can reduce the positions and we can uh, get closer to that target on that 35% uh, reserve fee. Um, then we also need to get some input from council on what you would want to do on that franchise fee schedule. Because, for example, if you said we don't want to put that out and don't want to adopt that until December of next year, then we need to retool the budget to be able to reflect that. Um, the big thing, I think, from just recapping the discussion for today is, you know, what as a council... Um, as a body, are you looking at for investment into some of those personnel resources? Uh, do you have some guidance that you'd like to offer for that? Uh, Councilman Jensen has already indicated that he wanted to target trying to hold the uh, overall tax levy steady from the prior year. Uh, if that's the view of the entire council, then we need to know that. Um, We've had some discussion that certainly seems to be some support from a couple of the council members on where we're putting dollars for public safety allocations. We would need some guidance on that as well to help shape up the second draft. So this is the point at which I get to stop talking for a while and <laughs> you as a group can deliberate and hopefully give us some guidance. And I was going to mention if it's, if it's helpful, I was able to... Um, look at our fund, our fund balance model for the general fund. So, um, um, Council Member Brandt, your question about what would happen if we, the current 39.3%, which is above the 35% um, threshold that we have set up by, by um, policy by Council, um, what I'm showing is every 1% reduction is about $170,000. Um, the one thing I would caution with that, though, is as we're looking at looking to um, utilize those dollars for savings in the general fund, is they would be used for one-time um, purchases because once again we're we're building we're um, spending down fund balance we're not actually bringing on new revenue so something like execute time or some of our larger projects that are a one-time cost would then uh, relieve some of the other pressures on the general fund to free up that cap capital for that year so just to let you know it's not ongoing revenue but it would be something that we could potentially um, if the council was interested in it um, get closer to that 35 percent so explain that to me on, on, so if we take this 1% and it's 175,000, where's that money coming from? Fund balance. Yeah. Which fund balance? Though? Oh, general fund, fund balance. There's a current 35% um, um, Is the minimum we have level. to reserve. Correct. That's what we set for a minimum. And right now it's, right now as we have it in our model, um, it's at 39.3%. 39 and we usually, as Lon mentioned, we run a little bit high on it, meaning we usually run somewhere between <coughs> 39, almost even 40 in some cases. Well, it's not actually revenue. It's just taken out of a cash reserve. Correct. And I mean, that's all we're doing. Yes. Yeah. And depending what hits in 19, that's the other component of it, which was mentioned by Councilman Jensen as well, of 19. Yeah. It presumes to our estimates are going to go forward with 19 because 19 does affect 20. So it's year-over-year -year changes. Yeah, and I, when I've uh, constructed the budgets in the past, I'll I try to informally stay around that 38, 39 percent. There have been a few years where I've gone below that, where we're fairly tight <coughs> on looking at the estimates, and we are already asking for some significant increases in one arena for another. Uh, the thing that I, with this one that we've got to be a little cautious of is that, you know, the draft budget contemplates a 1.35 million in franchise fees, and if that were to get delayed to, say, December, um, that general fund, that balance between the 35 and 39 percent is the bridge to when we would actually start getting those collected. So I've been cautious about that, knowing that um, we didn't have a, a clear calendar yet from the utilities on 
once we adopt the franchise fee, once the ordinance is in place, when can we expect to start receiving that revenue? So uh, as we know some more clarity on that, I'd probably feel a little more comfortable pulling against that figure a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Um, but that's kind of the cushion that uh, I had hoped to build in to let us have that bridge to when the franchise fees would actually start being collected and coming in. I think in general up here, at least based on some of the other, some of the discussion we've had, there seems to be, correct me if I'm wrong, everybody, but some consensus about moving ahead on some of these franchise fees or certainly user fees. Again, some of these fees we've talked about in the last year but not enacted them, so I'm not sure how many dollars are involved with each one individually, but certainly from the standpoint of moving ahead with some of those, that would create some revenue and I think match some of the discussion that Randy and others have talked about up here, the saying, oh, let's move ahead, it's time to just make the decision and do what's needed. So mm -hmm. I don't know how everybody else feels about that one, at least that area. I would concur exactly with that. I think it's time that we <clears throat> start, you know, taking, uh, taking the lead on some of these things that we need to be kind of catching up on. So I would okay. be in favor of it. <clears throat> I think uh, just more broadly regarding the fees, but more broadly thinking about we seem to be quite conservative. First of all, good work today. Thank you. This is really helpful for um, me and I'm sure the rest of the team up here. So I appreciate all the hard work. Um, but some things I've been thinking about, right, is this idea of right sizing and which is a pretty big task. But how do we right size while we are not as conservative, but still conservative? And the fee structure and making sure that, um, you know, the serving our citizens and serving um, the, the folks that we serve, that they are paying their fair share um, without them burdening all of the expenses. Um, so I think just more broadly, how do we do some more right sizing? There's been a lot of conversation, but what I'm not clear on is, you know, what are the five or the ten things we're going to do in the next? fiscal year where we really are right sizing, right? So these are the fees, these are the, these are the, the analysis that we're going to do um, to start really pushing us in that direction. Um, I would guess if we don't do that at some point in time, two years from now, we'll be having the same conversation. So more generally, how do we start pushing us to do some more right sizing as we're continuing to grow as a community? Yeah, a couple of the pieces that we talked about here that would be um, initiatives leading towards that is to do that more robust analysis of the uh, proprietary funds, uh, particularly with the cost <laughs> allocations in the general fund, to make sure that they are really shouldering a fair share of the cost of the operations in the city. Because you have the direct costs like the, the crews and public services that provide those direct services, but then you have the support <laughs> services in City Hall um, that make it possible to have those operations. And why do you do that? Because if the finance department didn't do the books for road use, sanitary sewer, um, storm sewer, solid waste, they'd have to hire people directly to do that on their behalf. And so rather than hiring employees directly into those divisions, the finance department does it. But we need to make sure that we are appropriately allocating those costs then to those funds. Uh, same thing with looking at how we allocate the costs of uh, <coughs> projects in the CIP um, to figure out do you as a council feel that um, we should continue the practice of using general obligation bond dollars to pay for 100% of a street project even if 40% of that street project is sanitary sewer expense. And if that's that's the case, then we continue the current practice. If you think we should change it, then we need to come up with that funding mechanism in storm sewer that allows us to fund those expenses, either on a pay-as-you-go basis or to make sure that there's money built into that budget for debt service to be able to cover the pieces that it's going to be expected to pick up in the future. Uh, so those are two initiatives that would help us to do that right sizing. Um, Execute time is going to be uh, a project and 
I'm going to say it's going to take a lot of work to get that one done and do it right. I think uh, we were probably looking at one to two years from start to full implementation of that. But I do think it's going to uh, ultimately result in a substantial reduction of the amount of time, maybe not necessarily what it takes in on the finance side to process payroll, but certainly in the outlying departments for what they have to do to process payroll to get it ready. Because rather than necessarily having to have everything funneled from an employee to to administrative staff, to the department head, and then uh, ultimately up to finance and payroll. Um, it would go directly from the employee into the computer system for an approval, and then it would come automatically up to, uh, to finance. So it will streamline a lot of those processes for us. Um, so those are some fairly major initiatives. Um, then the analysis, the structural analysis of the uh, equipment replacement fund to make sure that we've got all the equipment that really is on a realistic replacement schedule um, and that we're transferring in the appropriate amounts. Uh, I can tell you that having a couple of years ago, having looked back through my fund uh, for the city manager's office, there was a fax machine in there. Well, you know, <laughs> had no intention of replacing a fax machine. Uh, so there's Probably mm -hmm. still a lingering typewriter or something like that out there, it. too. Uh, hopefully there's not a dictaphone or something like that that's mm -hmm. still in the fund. But that's the kind of analysis What's that we need to do. Need uh, but it's going to take a deeper yeah, dive than we, we have been able to yeah. do yeah. Um, with our existing staff. So uh, there's those strategic okay. initiatives. Um, there's also then the initiative uh, that we were talking about earlier where we're going to separate out communications as a function from the police department that will let us better hone in on our costs to provide those various services. So um, we do have several that are going to lead us down the path to making sure that we're right-sizing everything. I can't say that 100% certainty that we're going to be there, but we are, and we do have some major initiatives planned that will help us down that path. I would also just say I'm with um, Councilman Jensen in keeping the levies consistent at this point, especially thinking about um, the CIP and additional <coughs> fees and... Um, you know, what we're asking of our of our citizens um, and then us sort of doing our work behind the scenes to make sure that we're right-sizing. So I think that I just wanted to, that's where I am at this point. The thing I would say um, with that, remember when we went back through and we adopted the CIP, um, we did present the council Thanks with some potential uh, property tax increases that would be related to the debt that it would be taken on to service the CIP. So when we come back, unless you're going to scale back the CIP, um, the other alternative then is that those expenses will have to be shouldered more on the proprietary fund side. So in the second draft budget, there's likely to be a trade-off between what you see on the property tax side and what you see on the utility side. It's either that or reduce expenses, but there's not a way that you can have one without the other. And I'm fine with that. I'm, I can show it either way. Sure. I know philosophically, I think the council's probably picked up on the idea that I do think that the proprietary funds in many cases are a more appropriate place to that we should be looking to them to provide more of those resources. As individual business units, they should be paying their, their fair share. And when, especially when it comes to things like capital projects, uh, the council does have a lot more discretion. And property taxes are one thing, but in many cases they don't have a direct link to the consumption of resources. Two houses sitting side by side, if one has a finished basement, doesn't mean that it produces any more sanitary sewer than the one next door that doesn't, but they're paying more in property taxes. So I do feel uh, philosophically that the proprietary funds, because they're more directly related to consumption or demand, are a better place to look for those. I agree. The more, and it's more easily explained. I mean, the more we can tie what, you know, um, the revenue source is to the actual uh, use or need. I think it's it's easier explained and and, and it makes makes sense. So it's hard to argue with it when you know when you can tie it, tie them together that way. I think it's nice as well too. Now that we got Zach on board here with us, I think we've got you know hopefully you've got the tools that you need, Lon, to to put these into their categories and their respective boxes and 
we can break these out a little bit more, you know, refined and defined. Yeah, um, it's been a big help. Uh, I, I told him that, you know, after one morning where I came in and I don't think he'd gone home, uh, that it was not my intention to make it feel like that he was to going to be here without a net, uh, that if he needed to bounce things off me to make sure that he folded me in on the conversations. Uh, but the, the especially the three folks sitting here to my right have done a lot of work to help put the budget together this time around. And uh, it's now that I'm kind of getting used to it, um, that will allow me to start focusing on some of the bigger strategic initiatives that we've talked about with uh, City Council for the things that you want me to focus on. So uh, it's been a good addition, but you know, the annual budget process is very compressed because of the way the state has the process set out. So after we get past this one, uh, I would think that with what we're going to be able to work on over the next year, the FY21 budget could potentially look very different. Uh, one question. We, we talked, obviously we know that the biggest line items in the budget are salaries and benefits. Uh, so we've talked somewhat about the benefits, especially the health care cost. So on the salaries, what is the uh, average or overall percentage increase included in the budget? Uh, right now, um, is this, you right scaled now. it back? And, and the way it's built in is our current pay for performance structure. It's um, the increases take effect, and this is for non-bargaining units. Bargaining units have different contracts depending upon um, understand. where they sit. But for non-bargaining units, um, it applies every uh, um, if you've been here long enough every April. So on this coming April, there'll be um, right now a 5% increase built into the budget. The expectation that or the budget that individuals will receive up to 5 or 5% since we don't know how that's going to be structured, but at 5%. And then next year, it's also built in at 5%. One of the things we've talked about is scaling it back to 3.5% as, as, as Lon's been talking to that number. But I wanted to mention it's not, unfortunately, because it's only a portion of the year, it would take effect in April. And now we're doing our positions in New World, so we can get very granular with them. We're only talking three months. April is That's May fine, year. but if we're, talking, if we're talking budget year 20... Uh, so my question is going to be for each half percent, what does that equate to in the effect or the impact on that deficit that we're talking about? So if we come, if we work, with, work on draft two, if we'll you do. can kind of put that into a translation for us, that would be okay. terrific. So again, we're talking about places on how we can maybe have some impact. And I just want to at least, I think we need to know uh, at least for each half percent, what does that equate to? Okay. Yeah, and that's why I said I knew that we'd be able to make a significant narrowing on that $444,000 gap that we have in here because uh, making the change, there are a lot of pieces like that. Making the change from the, the initial draft budget 5% back to 3.5 is going to make a difference on what that number looks like. Um, we're going to do another deeper dive into the medical insurance side of it because we actually have two analyses done of that. <coughs> um, Wellmark gives us suggestion rates, but we also have a contract with uh, Gallagher benefit services and they look at it a little bit differently. Um, they're both actuarially sound methods, um, but the way that they look at it, Wellmark, for example, doesn't include what we're carrying in our funding reserves. Gallagher does. And so we'll take a look at what they're proposing and see, you know, we might be able to come back with some trimming on some of those costs as well, which again helps with that overall bottom line. Anything else that the council wants to see in the next draft? <coughs> and typically, uh, barring anything from council to the contrary, um, what I've done in the past is kind of give a menu of options for things that you can choose from. Uh, so for example, if you come back and there is still uh, a little bit of a deficit or a gap that needs to be covered, what could be taken out of the budget with four or five choices that the council could select from to do that. Uh, additionally, um, we usually will they'll then give you the budget with a menu of other proposed things that might have been in a draft or that we picked up on from uh, council discussion that we can give you a cost that, okay, if you want to add this, this is the X number that it has on the bottom line. 
um, I would anticipate that we'll have uh, four or five selections for you on that menu as well. Be good. So the only other thing then that I would want to confirm is, you know, based on today, we had reserved Monday for a second work session, not knowing how far we were going to get. Uh, I did not expect to try to do the first draft for the second draft over the weekend and then have you review the second draft on Monday. So uh, unless council has strong opinions to the contrary, I would think we would not need the Monday work session. And then we'll just schedule the um, review for the first to second draft at the normal a door in meeting. Okay. Sounds good to me. Any other discussion okay. or direction from council? <coughs> None here. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Appreciate all the hard work on this. Thank you.